Welcome. People did a good job on the discussion boards. I'd like to make a few comments about John Stuart Mill's argument and the way that we've tended to respond to him in our discussions so far. First, it's important not to get confused between Mill's argument and arguments about natural rights. Mill rejects the idea that there's something inherently wrong with repressing people's individuality independent of the consequences. Mill is a utilitarian and he sticks to the claim that he can only defend liberty based on the consequences. So a lot of times people would say, would start discussing what will happen and then their sort of closing argument was, and people have a right to live their lives as they see fit. Well, I'm sympathetic to that claim, but we have to remember that's not Mill's argument. So if we're assessing Mill's argument, it has to be based on the consequences, not a claim that there's something inherently bad about people not being able to live their lives as they choose. The next point I want to make has to do with the problem that I refer to as mass individualism. When we talk about removing restrictions on how people think, the next question has to be, so if we remove these restrictions, what is going to determine what they think? There's a reason I say this. As I said on one of the discussion boards, there's a tendency for us to identify what we think of as the big bad sources of oppression. Government influence, for some people it would be public education, for some people it might be certain very strong religious authorities, whatever it is. So people have the idea, well, these are the big bad sources of oppression, and those are what are keeping people from thinking for themselves. And then I say, okay, but what happens when you remove or lessen the influence of the big bad source of oppression? It might turn out that the thing that then tends to shape people's opinions is really not obviously any better than the old thing. Here's, one, here's an example I sometimes use to illustrate this. I have a friend who is about the most thoughtful person I've ever met. Very thorough in his research, very intelligent, very willing to question his assumptions, etc. He's a devout Roman Catholic, and he takes a lot of his views from the Roman Catholic Church, very consciously so. And he said that people will say to him sometimes, well, you just believe that because your religion says it. Or I suspect sometimes he'll get, well, you only believe that because you're Catholic. Well, but then we have to raise the question, okay, so the people that aren't deferring to that kind of religious authority, where are they getting their opinions from? Is it purely from personal research? Or are they influenced by television, advertising, newspapers, okay? Whatever the dominant trend in academia is. So what am I pointing to here? What I'm pointing to is the fact that there are limits to the extent to which a person can think for himself. All of us are dependent on our upbringing, our sources of information, our, who we trust, etc. Nobody researches everything that they think of down to the basic first principles. To give an extreme example, I believe that the earth is round because all the authorities I trust tell me that the earth is round. I haven't been into space. I haven't done the measurements. I don't look at ships coming over the horizon. I haven't gotten a telescope and looked to see if there's really a round shadow on the moon. I take that on trust from other people. And that's a rational way to behave. If I tried to go and do every experiment in the history of science for myself, that would get me nowhere in life. So a certain amount of influence from other people, from systems, etc., is a necessary part of intellectual inquiry. For that reason, when we talk about removing obstacles to free thought, free choice, etc., we have to be very honest about where the resulting choices, thoughts, etc., are coming from. 
So if we're contrasting one apparent source of censorship with a totally unrealistic picture of how independent people can be in their thought, then we don't really have an argument. We're comparing something that imposes limitations in the real world with a fantasy world of no limitations whatsoever. Okay. That's not a good way to make decisions about social and political philosophy. It has to be contrasting one set of proposals with possible alternatives. Now that brings me to my third point, which is a point I'm going to draw from James Madison. James Madison and others in the debates over the founding of the Republic made the following point. If you do things like have religious disestablishment and certain kinds of things that gives people freedom of inquiry, freedom of belief, freedom of practice, etc., the hope is that by removing something that has coercive authority, there will be a hundred different influences from a hundred different directions on people. And therefore, people will be somewhat more free because there's a lot of little influences on them and that gives them more opportunity to rationally choose between those influences. But then the question is, how likely is that to be true? Or how, it, in contrast, are we likely to find ways of having mass individualism no matter what we do? Obviously, the sources I'm thinking of in the modern world are Hollywood and Madison Avenue. But if they went away tomorrow, it might be that other forms of mob influence just take their place. So we have to, that's another spot where we have to say it's nice to say if we remove these obstacles that people will be influenced by so many different little influences that nothing can dominate in a dangerous way. But then we have to ask, is that really likely to ever happen? And if it's not, we have to say, okay, what are our real options and compare the kinds of censorship that Mill opposes with our real options, not an imagined situation that's never gonna happen. I should stress, I don't wanna come down on any side of this debate. I just want to point out that these are questions we have to ask when we're evaluating consequentialist arguments, or I could say utilitarian arguments for liberty.